Coming up on today's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast, ESPN.com put out a piece on their website on Wednesday that really helped confirm what I and what I believe most of Raider Nation already believe. What am I talking about? Well, we'll get to it and a lot more coming up on today's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast for Thursday, July 13th, 2023. Just win. Just win. Just win. Just win. The autumn wind is a raider. Pillaging just for fun. He'll knock you round and upside down and laugh when he's conquered and won. And won. And won. And won. And won. And welcome here, Raider Nation, to another edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast to get the latest edition of the show as soon as it becomes available. And of course, as always, if you're checking us out on YouTube, we thank you. We appreciate you. Without you, there is no us, obviously. And when I say us, I'm talking about my man Ari, who does a great job each and every day getting us up on YouTube. You can check him out or shoot him a note or whatever, even a thank you on Twitter at Ari Produces. You want to hit me up on Twitter, you could do that as well. Well, at your boy Q254, and if you want to get something in on the show, 707-654-4693. Got calls and texts coming up in segment number three of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. In segment number two, there was a really good piece put out on ESPN.com on Wednesday. Seth Wickersham, he was part of it, did a really good job, and it goes into the investigation of Daniel Snyder and everything that was going on in D.C. And, of course, the investigation that led to Daniel Snyder and all the findings Remember, a lot of that had to do with, and we found out the hard way, Raider Nation, about John Gruden and his emails, right? Going all the way back to 2021. Remember the week before, uh, or actually a few days before that Chicago Bears game that was at Allegiant Stadium. That was a very bad performance, and that Monday is when John Gruden re- resigned. So uh, there's a piece that's out there on ESPN.com. It was talked about quite a bit. On Wednesday, uh, Seth Wickersham was on my radio station on uh, Raider Nation Radio 920. He was on with the morning tailgate, Clay and Vinny Bonsignor. And then, of course, I actually was on uh, ESPN doing Freddie and Fitzsimmons on Wednesday night. And Seth Wickersham was part of the show as well. And we were talking about the piece called He Was Free and Clear. How to leak a John Gruden's emails led to the fall of Commander's owner, Dan Snyder. So you'll hear a few breakdowns from Seth Wickersham coming up in segment number two of the show. And here in segment number one, news and notes of the day. And so far, there's no movement when it comes to the Josh Jacobs contract watches. We're still on Josh Jacobs watch. But I will say this. As the date gets closer and closer to the 17th, we had a call. I believe Raider Eddie in Denver had called uh, earlier in the week about Josh Jacobs and the camp that he did not do and put on for the, the kids in Las Vegas. Well, he ultimately did that, right? And he's back in Las Vegas. He actually sat down with good friend Paloma Villacana from Fox 5 Sports to talk about the camp, talk about his future with the Raiders. And she's going to be on my radio show a little bit later on this afternoon at 4 p.m. Pacific time to talk about that. So the good news is Josh Jacobs is in Las Vegas, which is great because Again, the date, the 17th, is the date you're looking for. 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific time is when they have to get a long-term deal, that kind of contract hammered out. So knowing that he's in town, knowing that he's been around the facility, if you check out his Instagram page, he's uh, put out some, you know, some just... Well, again, kind of cryptic messages, but it looks like he's been in and around the facilities. So maybe there's some movement when it comes to the Josh uh, Jacobs contract situation. But again, one step closer to again, it resolved, I feel like, with him at least being in town. So we'll continue to monitor that as that 17th date is coming up quick, fast, in a hurry, as I like to say. Monday, again, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific time. They've got to have a long-term deal hammered out that goes for Josh Jacobs that goes for Saquon Barkley and that goes for anyone else that's holding that franchise tag so uh, that'll be something to pay attention to for sure now something else that came out on Wednesday from Adam Schefter which I got pretty excited about and that's the fact that the 60 semifinalists for the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame were announced and 31 semifinalists for the senior candidate consideration and you're probably wondering Why are you worried about the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame when the 2023 class hasn't even been inducted yet? Well, the 2023 class will be inducted sooner rather than later in August. Uh, That's the Hall of Fame game coming up. That'll be the first preseason game of the 2023 season. That's coming up sooner rather than later. But the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame class, I'm excited with the 31 semifinalists for the senior candidate consideration because there's three people, three guys that are in consideration that have Raider ties. Albert Lewis, defensive back from 1983 to 1998. They say considered one of the top cover corners of his era. 
Lewis intercepted 42 passes in 14 seasons, career with the Kansas City Chiefs from 83 to 93, and the Los Angeles and Oakland Raiders from 94 to 98. Also blocked 11 kicks on special teams. Albert Lewis, I remember when he would run with Terry McDaniel. Uh, him and him and Terry McDaniel was really good one-two punch for that Raiders secondary. And I also remember when those guys got old. And that was right when the Raiders decided to go make the move for some young guy out of, out of Michigan named Charles Woodson. Yeah, he turned out to be pretty good as well. So Albert Lewis is part of the semifinalists for the senior candidates of the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame. Also running back Roger Craig, 1983 to 93, first NFL player to total 1,000 yards rushing and receiving the same season and won three Super Bowls with the 49ers, spent eight seasons with San Francisco, one with the Raiders, and two with the Minnesota Vikings, total 13,100 yards from scrimmage and scored 73 touchdowns. And I believe that Roger Craig is a Hall of Famer. I really do. I don't consider him a Raider. I know he played with the Raiders, and I know once a Raider, always a Raiders, but or once a Raider, always a Raider, but it was one season in 91. So I, I really never look at Roger Craig as a as a Raider, similar to when even looking at Ronnie Lott. And I know that you know he's got much love for the Raiders, and the Raiders have much love for him, but I think of those guys, and I think of San Francisco 49ers off top. But he did have a, a, a cup of coffee with the Raiders back in 1991. So he's uh, amongst the 31 semifinalists for the senior candidate for the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame. But most importantly, why I'm really excited about this is the judge. Lester Hayes, number 37. All the talk we've had about number 37 and how I was saying James trapped this and James trapped that. And I know there's a 37 out there that I'm not thinking of. And it was Lester Hayes. And I don't know what it was. Maybe because I was on vacation mode. I was ready to go to Hawaii with the family. I don't know what made me just kind of blank on Lester Hayes. But uh, probably the greatest number 37. For sure the number 37. Best number 37 in the history of the silver and black. He is also up for the 2024 Pro Football Hall of Fame, Lester Hayes, cornerback 77 to 86, known as the Judge. Hayes was a five time Pro Bowler for the Oakland and the LA Raiders, spending his entire 10 year career with the organization, intercepting 39 passes in his career, including a league best 13 in 19. 19- so those guys are all part of the mix when it comes to uh, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And and also, and I didn't even really uh, pay attention to that one. I kind of missed it. Uh, Art Powell as well. So I didn't have the write-up on him, but I remember that Art Powell was part of that as well. So actually four guys. Uh, I didn't have his write-up written down, so I apologize. But Art Powell also is part of the 31 semifinalists for the senior candidate consideration for the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2024. So I know you're asking now, okay, so... There's, what, 60 semifinalists? Obviously, 60 people aren't going into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So what's next? Well, glad you asked. The respective selection committees now will consider the candidates and vote to send 12 seniors and 12 coach contributors through to the next stage. The results of those reduction votes will be announced by July 27th. That is after, that's the second day of the Raiders training camp. Coach contributor committee members will meet August 15th to select one coach or contributor for final consideration for the class of 2024. The Seniors Committee, which is important, will meet August 22nd and may select up to three seniors for final consideration as members of the Class of 2024. Expansion of the seniors pool for election to the hall was approved in 2022 for the Class of 2023, 2024, and 2025. So that's what matters to us, right? The Senior Committee will meet August 22nd and may select up to three seniors for final consideration. Look, there's 31 seniors that are on the ballot. I'm just hoping the judge is one of the three that gets selected. If one of those three, get, if, if he's one of those three that gets selected, as John McClain has told me uh, many times after that stage, it's just about rubber stamping. So I'm really hoping. So Raider Nation really be paying attention. Uh, the committee, committee will meet August 22nd. And let's hope when they meet and they come out of those meetings, we hear Lester Hayes, the judge, is one of the three one of the three that are moving on uh, to the next round of consideration for the 2024 class of Hall of Fame, class of the Hall of Fame at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That would be awesome. Would love to see that. And definitely rooting for Lester Hayes, a really good dude, a dude that deserves to be in the Hall of Fame and really deserved to be in the Hall of Fame a long time ago. But that's what I got for you for segment number one of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Got news and notes of the day coming up in segment number two. You'll hear the breakdown from Seth Wickersham as he joined the morning tailgate on Raider Nation Radio 920. He's from ESPN talking about the Gruden emails and how they led to the fall of, well, Dan Snyder as the owner of the Washington Commanders. We'll do that in segment number two after we talk about our partners at eBay Motors and the fact that they've teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Football host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long. Whether you're prepping for a draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you players that are guaranteed 
to fit on your roster. And anyone who knows me and has ever talked to me knows I'm not a big fantasy football uh, guy at all, but I respect fantasy football and I respect that so many people love fantasy football. So with draft prep underway for the upcoming season, let's see who Vinny has picked out for us on this week's eBay's Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. And, well, yesterday I talked about Austin Eckler from the Chargers. How about another running back? How about Christian McCaffrey, C-Mac? Right? The one that was traded from the Carolina Panthers to the 49ers and looked like a big time move, which it was by John Lynch and company. Well, let's talk about C Mac. And uh, Vinny goes on to say when making the first overall pick in fantasy football drafts in 2023, 49ers running back Christian McCaffrey is a guaranteed fit. A healthy McCaffrey is guaranteed to see well more than 300 touches again in his first full season in San Francisco and is the centerpiece of the 49ers offensive engine. McCaffrey checks all the boxes, including his talent and usage, high floor and ceiling. Run with CMC as the guaranteed fit at number one for a smooth ride to another year of big numbers. Vinny from Locked On Fantasy Football is going to help you win your fantasy championship, and eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. With eBay guaranteed fit and over 122 million parts and accessories for your vehicle right at your fingertips, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Air filters, brakes, batteries, taillights, alternators, shocks and struts, you name it eBay Motors has it, and they'll make sure it's the right fit for your car because eBay Guaranteed Fit helps you understand exactly what part you need for your vehicle the first time. So, go forth. Switch screws, crank the AC, say goodbye to sweating if your ride needs a little fixing up because now you know you'll always be set up for success from the get-go. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, everything your vehicle is calling for is just a click away. For the parts and accessories that fit your vehicle, just look for the green check. Get the right parts, the right fit, and... The right prices, most importantly, at ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay, guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. All right, Raider Nation, here we go. Segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Want to get into a breakdown of the Wickersham piece on ESPN. He was free and clear how the leak of John Gruen's emails led to the fall of Commander's owner, Dan Snyder. And I'll tell you right now, when I woke up on Wednesday, the last thing I thought I was going to be talking about or reading about is John Gruden and his emails, even though I know that there's an existing lawsuit going on with John Gruden against the NFL. And I'll tell you right now, he ain't backing down. That's one thing you can say about John Gruden, and I've said a long time ago, even before he returned to the sidelines for the Silver and Black, I said, you know what? He embodies what a Raiders coach is, a guy who really embraces being a Raider. And to go up against the NFL like he is, digging his heels in, not backing down, has plenty of money and plenty of time to go ahead and battle the NFL, if that ain't Raider-like, I don't know what is. And so, of course, I'm not at all trying to you know, downplay what he said or what he wrote in those emails. I'm not trying to excuse it because it's inexcusable, right? No doubt about that. But I think we all know and we all knew pretty much when that investigation was going on of the Washington Commanders, the one guy that ended up dropping and falling from that was John Gruden, which it's like, okay, wait, hold on. You're looking at Washington, D.C. You're looking at the commanders, but the guy who's going to take the collateral damage, who's going to be the fall guy, is the head coach of the Silver and Black. Wait, that didn't make any kind of sense. And then the timing of it was just really odd. So I I believe then that it was one of those moves where the emails came from Dan Snyder, Bruce Allen, uh, anyone that was within that uh, Washington organization. Of course, Bruce Allen was already gone by then, and he had beef with Dan Snyder as well. So most likely it wasn't him, even though you knew that Bruce Allen was John Gruden's friend. So that's where the emails have gone to. But, uh, you know, it's not not necessarily saying, especially after reading this piece, that Dan Snyder is the one that, that leaked him. But obviously there was an agenda from Dan Snyder. There was an agenda from the commissioner. There was an agenda from Demora Smith from the NFLPA, which I didn't realize until I read this piece. Really interesting stuff. So I definitely encourage you to go read it for yourself. Take a a nice little chunk of time, 20, 25 minutes. Just read it, digest it, and understand it. Because, again, I thought it was a really good piece. It's up there right now. You can check it out on ESPN.com. But uh, as Seth Wickersham made his rounds on Wednesday, he was on the Raider Nation Radio 920 on the morning tailgate show. He talked to me on ESPN later on in the evening. Uh, I had a couple breakdowns from what he had to say, and the first one was really about the initial conference call. Remember that week? Remember that Friday? Remember that Friday when the Raiders are getting ready to prepare to play the Chicago Bears, and all of a sudden we started hearing news about these emails, and none of us really knew what was going on, including Mark Davis. What about when he got that initial conference call between him and and, uh, and Roger Goodell. Here's Seth Wickersham kind of breaking that down. Yeah, Raiders fans will probably remember it a little bit better than the general public, but um, that was a couple hours before um, the Wall Street Journal 
um, was going to, uh, or I'm sorry, it was a few hours after the Wall Street Journal had published um, its story um, with John Gruden's email about DeMora Smith, his offensive email. And um, Goodell and Pash hopped on the phone with Davis and Dan Ventrelli, who was the team president at the time. And uh, it felt weird for Davis because you know, there was obviously a lot of outcry for him to fire Gruden, and he, you know, had known Gruden for almost a quarter century and was kind of trying to slow down a, a hurricane from within it, if that makes sense. He was trying to say, like, look, I know that there's a lot of outcry going on, but I got to, like, slow this down and make a decision on my terms mm-hmm. about Gruden's future. And, you know, Passion Goodell kept saying to him, you got to do something. There's more emails coming. And he couldn't Davis was confused as how they knew that more emails were coming and why he was learning about the emails after everybody else had. It turned out these emails that Gruden had sent 10 years ago, um, 10 years prior, had been kind of gossip fodder around the league office. But they kept telling Davis, you got to do something, you got to do something. And uh, he felt he was kind of backed into a corner. And then, um, you know, he later ended up saying – to an associate, oh, he had to John Gruden, F the NFL and F Dan Snyder because he was so frustrated at the way that um, that had been handled. I love what MD said there. I love what he what Seth Wickersham says that Mark Davis said at the end. Uh, F the NFL and F Dan Snyder. And I mean, there's no mistake in it. Mark Davis was very upset by the fact that he had to eventually, uh, you know, urge John Gruden to resign. And obviously they ended up settling, uh, you know, with the rest of his contract that he still had had left seven years uh, on that hundred million dollar, that 10 year hundred million dollar contract. He ended up settling, of course, getting a, a large chunk of change. So, I mean, he's obviously going to be very comfortable, uh, but that's that's Mark Davis's friend. And so he felt like he was in a really bad place. He felt like he was stuck in a, in a spot where the NFL was really springing things on him and putting the pressure on him, and he really didn't have any kind of opportunity to do his own due diligence, do his own investigating, you know, kind of trying to weigh the pros and the cons. It's just like, hey, do something, do something, do something, do something, do something, and then eventually something had to be done. So here's a lengthier a little sound by a little breakdown from Seth Wickersham on the timing of the email, because that's always something that I wondered. You know, why the timing of it? It was so curious and odd. And again, uh, you know, these emails are something that the NFL had in their possession way before the season ever got started, way before training camp ever got started. But yet it didn't come out until the Raiders were off to what, a three and one start in the season. And, you know, I'm not saying that they're just trying to bring down the Raiders, but it was really curious timing. The season got wonky. Of course, that wasn't the only adversity that the Raiders had to deal with. They had to deal with the Henry Ruggs situation a little bit later on. But uh, the Friday before the Bears game is when these email releases and these leaks started happening. So why did it take so long to come out? Here's Seth Wickersham responding to that. I wish I knew. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, if I can just take a second here. Let's go back to June of 21. Right. So this is, you know, know, four, four or five months before those emails come out. Um, Beth Wilkinson, the NFL, the attorney who the NFL and Dan Snyder had hired to investigate the workplace in Washington, was finishing her report. And remember, everybody had expected a report from her. A couple weeks before she's due to, you know, before an announcement is going to be made with her findings, Dan Snyder's lawyers, including Joe Tacopina, who is on air a lot defending President, you know, former President Trump. Do you know anything's going to get interesting when he's involved? Um, and a couple other lawyers from the law firm Reed Smith go to the NFL offices, and they are to present a defense for Dan Snyder against some of her findings, against the Wilkinson findings. And rather than a defense, what followed was a PowerPoint presentation that shocked the people who were involved. Um, it was a series of screenshots of potentially embarrassing emails and texts from several league executives, including Jeff Pash. And the rationale was to kind of argue that the hypocrisy of the league going after Snyder and judging him, but the tactics were so ruthless that some of the the attorneys involved uh, felt uncomfortable. And the signal was clear that if Goodell didn't do what Snyder wanted in terms of handling the Wilkinson report and the punishment, those emails and texts would be leaked. And it became known in league circles as the blackmail PowerPoint. So 
the Wilkinson report, of course, gets buried. There was no report. There was only a press release. Snyder was weighing in on word choices. He was dictating his punishment, we were told. Mm-hmm. And um, then the league sent off those emails that were part of the investigation, 650,000 of them, to get sorted by an IT department. They didn't even talk about the emails in any official capacity. They were mostly just kind of gossip fodder around the league. Then, early the week of October 4th, 2021, um, some senior league officials bring the emails to Roger and let him know, bring summaries of the emails to Roger to let him know that they're problematic. And a lot of those Gruden emails were part of it. And um, at that point, only two parties had access to the server with those emails, the NFL and Dan Snyder. And um, they showed Roger Goodell those emails. They were supposed to remain confidential. And within days, the Wall Street Journal had it. And within days after that, the New York Times had more emails. And that coincidence, again, it's like that's the basis of John Gruden's lawsuit is that he believes that Roger Goodell – directly leaked those emails and um you know it'll be interesting to see what happens the league obviously denies that goodell or anybody from the league office leaked them um both in court and in public they've denied that but the coincidence of that timing like you said is very suspicious and i think that even executives and owners around the league um raise an eyebrow about the timing of that really lengthy but good really good detailed stuff from Seth Wickersham. And again, that kind of detail is what you're going to get in this piece if you go read it. Again, it was really good. I mean, I read it multiple times, talked about it multiple times on multiple radio shows. It was just something that I had to do, right? Again, didn't think that I was going to be talking about John Gruden in any capacity anytime soon, especially right before training camp. But, you know, hey, this is how it is. It's July. Uh, You know, ESPN knew that, man, there's not really a lot going on right now. Let's go ahead and drop this right now so at least it'll get a lot of traction. People will have eyes on it and ears on all the words and everything that's being said, including uh, by Seth Wickersham. So the final soundbite that I have for you for segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast is, okay, well, is there any clarity on who leaked the emails? Was it Goodell? Was it Snyder? Was it D. Moore Smith? Was it the representation from Rock Nation? Who in the hell leaked the emails? I want to be clear. You know, we do not say that we know who leaked the emails. We have kind of a circular firing squad of people. Demora Smith has, Mm -hmm. you know, he's bragged to people that he leaked the original Gruden email to the journal. We have Reed Smith. We have Rock Nation. People pointing the fingers at that from the league office, pointing the fingers at them. They deny it, obviously. But you're totally right, because within days of the leaks, a congressional committee launched that wide-ranging investigation of the commanders in the NFL, and it forced Goodell and Allen and Snyder to testify under oath. We have a source who said that they would not have been doing that. They right. not, would not have opened that if, if not for those emails. And that led to a federal criminal investigation about alleged financial misconduct by Snyder and the team. And as the pressure mounted, as Don and I reported in October, along with our colleague Tisha Thompson, Snyder was bragging to people that he had dirt on his fellow owners and Goodell that could blow up the league. And, you know, those series of things all became a tipping point. Then you had Jim Ursay a couple weeks after our story come out, publicly kind of say that they had to consider moving on from Dan from the ownership ranks. And two weeks after that, he announces that uh, he's selling the team. And so, that series of events, it's just, it's undeniably linked to the release of these emails. And, um, you know, again, you know, people wonder again, you know, why did Dan end up like back, finally backing down and on the sale of his team? And um, it's been a long time coming, but I do think that that first week in October was the tipping point. So there's Seth Wickersham talking about who leaked the emails and the fact that, you know, they're not identifying a certain person. There's plenty of people with the agenda to do it. Hell, Roger Goodell, I mean, his own right-hand man was part of this whole situation going on with, uh, with Dan Snyder and, the, and the, what he called the blackmail slideshow, which is ridiculous. And, and I talked about it in, in such length on Wednesday about, you know, this guy being so arrogant that he has a situation going on with him where they're investigating him for all the bad that he's done. And instead of instead of him defending himself or saying or denying it and saying he didn't do anything, he's like, yeah, I ain't going to worry about that. 
But look at what I have over here about this guy. And look what I have over here about this guy. And look what I have about – you know what I'm saying? Like, I couldn't imagine that. And I, I, look, I'm not in any kind of high-profile position, but I can never understood, Stan, if I had been called into the office or called into any, any position of authority, like someone came to me and said, all right, Q, look, you need to explain what's going on here. We heard this, that, and the other about you. And instead of even acknowledging it, I just said, yeah, you know, what about this guy? Look what, what, look what he's got going on. And look what he's got going on. And look what I got on him. Aha, I got this. You know what I mean? Like, I could never imagine doing that. But, you know, Dan Snyder, everyone always said he was Teflon Don. He obviously acted like he was Teflon Don. And that's just kind of the arrogance of who he is. But those are just a couple sound bites. I mean, that was a, you know, 20, 25 minute interview uh, from Wednesday from Raider Nation Radio 920. I talked to Seth again for another 15, 16 minutes on ESPN on Wednesday. I mean, the dude has been busy talking about his great piece that you could check out. And I encourage you to check it out on ESPN.com. How the leak of John Gruden's emails led to the fall of commander's owner. Dan Snyder, your calls and texts are coming up in segment number three, seven Oh seven, six, five, four, four, six, nine, three. This is the locked on Raiders podcast. Here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number three of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Want to get to your calls and texts. Draft that Locked On Raider podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. Let's start things off with Raider Roy calling from Montreal. He's calling to talk about the potential of the Raiders making a move for Patrick Queen or potentially losing running back Josh Jacobs, something that we talked about on Wednesday's show. Here he is, Raider Roy in Montreal. Q, what up? It's Raider Roy from the NPL 514, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. How you doing, bro? Uh, first off, I wanted to say we really appreciate you out here. Um, listen to you every day. The Raiders fans go through and through wide and wide. So you are loved over here in Montreal. Uh, just in response to um, what, what, we, what we think is going to happen with Jacobs and getting a middle linebacker. To be honest with you, I truly believe that they're set on a middle linebacker position. They have Bernie and Diablo. I guarantee you Bernie's going to be in the lineup 100%, uh, and Diablo, hopefully healthy, will handle the load as well. So I don't see them getting a Patrick Queen. They don't, they don't need a Patrick Queen. I think they're set there. I know they have some young cats there, but um, I, I, I believe that they're, they're going to roll with them unless there's a major injury and uh, see what happens with that. Also, Josh Jacobs, I'm sad to say, but I'm pretty sure he's gone. Um, either will be released or traded. Unfortunately, I know in his mind he's probably wanting, you know, 14 to 16 million a year, uh, probably three to five year contract, which I think is really un- unreasonable in this case, the way that the, 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 the RB market is going. Um, you know, I can see potentially them offering him maybe two years, uh, 24 million guaranteed, uh, 12 million a year guarantee. I mean, that would be probably realistic in my book and maybe a little bit too much, but I think at the end of the day, uh, he is, you know, uh, one of the best running backs in the league right now. So, and he, he wants to be a Raider for life. So unfortunately, I think he wants a longer term. Um, that's about it for me. Uh, really appreciate you out here, bro. Keep up the good work and I look forward to hearing, uh, talking to you again. Ciao. Raider Roy, thanks for the call. Thanks for the kind words as well. I definitely appreciate you. And I, I absolutely hear what you're saying with the linebacker room. It could be good with what they have. Right. I mean, of course, Divine Diablo is coming back from injury. They went out, made the move for Robert Spillane. Luke Masterson did some good things. Darian Butler is a year older. Right. I mean, there's there's guys in that room that could contribute, contribute. You know, Curtis Bolton, he's really a special teams guy, but, you know, he can add a little something, something to the mix. Of course, they went out and, and drafted a linebacker as well uh, in Bernie out of out of uh, Florida. So, I mean, there's guys that could work. I just think that Queen would be an upgrade. And, and look, the thing about it is they'd have to trade for him, so I wouldn't want them to give up a lot of dra- uh, draft capital for him. But if they can get a, get him for a reasonable deal, and again, you know, he's going to want a contract extension. He's not Roquan Smith. Make no mistake about it. He's not that guy. But he, I think he could be a really good player coming off a really good year that he had in Baltimore. But again, that's just my thoughts. So we'll see. And as far as Josh Jacobs goes, uh, I, don't, I, I mentioned at the top of the show, there's no – new information about his contract, but the fact that he's in Vegas, he sat down with Paloma Villacana from Fox 5 Sports, talked about his camp, talking about his his future uh, with the silver and black. I think that's a positive, and I'll talk to her this afternoon, 4 o'clock Pacific time on my radio show, Unnecessary Roughness, on Radio Nation Radio 920, and I'll get all the details, and I'll bring it to the show and have it on the podcast tomorrow so you can hear for yourself what she has to say about Josh Jacobs, someone that she covered at Alabama, knows very well, has been covering him since he's been here in Las Vegas. So uh, if he's going to tell anybody anything, 
he'll tell her. So that conversation will come up on tomorrow's show. But Raider Roy, thank you so much for the call. I do appreciate you. Up next, got a text from Matt in Little Rock. He said, first off, thank you for all that you do for the Nation Q. And Ari, this is Raider 07, a.k.a. Matt from Little Rock. My question for you is, what position battles are you most intrigued by this training camp with all the rookies, undrafted, and veteran players brought in to fill starting roles? I'd love to hear your opinion. Thanks so much. That's Matt in Little Rock. And thank you for the text. Thank you for the kind words as well. I definitely appreciate you. And as you mentioned, Ari, he does a great job. So, yeah, definitely appreciate him as well. As far as position battles go, you know, I, I mentioned it a little bit on, uh, on Wednesday's show. The offensive line is pretty solid. But I know that there's some other guys, especially with the undrafted uh, players that they that they had and signed immediately after the draft, like McClendon Curtis. Uh, he's one guy, and Dalton Wagner's another guy. Both signed immediately after the draft. So I want to see how they're added to the mix, if they're added to the mix, you know, what they could do in training camp. That's going to be somewhat of a battle. You know, can someone uh, be replaced along that offensive line? Of course, the secondary is something that I'm really looking forward to, you know, especially with the rumors and reports that Marcus Peters is going to be added to the mix. If he is signed, obviously he's going to be cornerback one. So really, everyone's competing for one spot. Is Nate Hobbs competing for an outside spot? Is he competing for a slot spot? Is Tyler Hall competing for a slot spot? You know what I mean? Like, the secondary, I think, is going to be very, very competitive. That looks to be like a good, uh, like something to really pay attention to, right? A position to really pay attention to coming in training camp. I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, the, the back end as well, the safeties, right? Trayvon Merrick, I think that training camp has to be a big one for him. Chris Smith, the rookie out of Georgia, can he make an impact early on? Uh, those are all positions that I'm looking at, guys I'm looking at. And, of course, the defensive line is very deep. But who's going to establish themselves as someone who needs to be a starter? Is it going to be Bilal Nichols, who was a free agent? Is it going to be a Matthew Butler? You know, that was a guy drafted last year. Neil Farrell Jr. drafted last year. You know, they brought in other free agents as well. You know, could it be any of those guys? Could it be Byron Young, a guy that they drafted in the third round out of Alabama? All guys in all competition that I'm looking forward to. And I think there's going to be a lot of competition. That's basically what I rolled out right now. There's going to be a lot of competition in training camp, something to look forward to. So thank you so much for that text. It's good to hear from you, my man. I appreciate you. Up next, haven't heard from this guy in a while, Vader Raider in the 303. What up, though? <laughs> He's called to respond to ABA Ivan Davis' call a few days ago about former Raiders quarterback Derek Carr and why he's no longer a Raider. Here he is, Vader Raider in the 303. Q, Raider Nation. It's your boy Vader Raider. Haven't called in a while. Been a little busy. Uh, wanted to check in, see how the nation was doing. Heard something uh, the other day that uh, kind of caused me a little concern. And I hate to bring it up because he is no longer a Raider, but uh, this is in response to ABA Ivan Davis. Mr. Davis, with respect, Derek Carr did not get let go because of the defense. Derek Carr was let go because Derek Carr did not have a grasp of the offense. And Derek Carr, quite honestly, you know, underperformed. And we can talk about this all day long, and I don't really want to because, you know, I'm I'm absolutely, you know, done talking about Derek Carr. I've had enough of Derek Carr. I had nine seasons of Derek Carr, and it was a failure, in my opinion. Yes, he stabilized the position, but, you know, and Q, you know me. You know I'm a results kind of guy, and I'm the same guy that got on here and went after him when he threw a fourth down into the ground. <laughs> and... uh yeah, I just, I, I, Mr. Davis, with respect, I'm, I'm, you seem to be a very knowledgeable football person, but to say that Derek Carr, you know, was let go because the defense was the cause of it, yeah, I don't agree with that at all. I agree that Derek Carr, uh, had some problems, had some things that he couldn't get through, and he even admitted to it in some of the, some of the stuff I've seen on Twitter, you know, he's admitted that he had issues with coaches and, and he wasn't a good version of himself. So, and I'm going to go with that. And hopefully, you know, hopefully the Saints get the good version of Derek Carr. You know, get the, to me, the 2016 version, which was my favorite version of him. And, you know, hopefully they don't get the game three of the 2017 season against the Redskins where he became a totally different quarterback. So, all right, Q, uh, keep up the good work. You, you've been killing it here. You've been uh, rocking and rolling. Glad you had some good R&R &R with the fam and everything, and you're ready to roll. Looking forward to the season, kind of. Not real excited, but, you know, we'll see what these guys can do. 
Uh, hopefully Jimmy works out. If he does, he does. If he doesn't, well, I guess we're <laughs> starting over with a new quarterback someday. All right, Ra- Raider Nation, uh, have a great day, Q. Uh, as always, thanks for everything you bring to the pod. Raider, Raider, out. Thank you so much for the call, my man. I appreciate you. You know it's great to hear from you as always, and it's obviously been a minute, but like I said, it's good to hear from you. And I don't really want to start the car debates, really, uh, on the show. I mean, I'm pretty much over it once he had his say about, you know, not giving the Raiders everything that that he thought that he should have gave them in 2022 for one reason or the other, right? Things that were on the field, things were out of his control off the field, whatever the case may be. Talked about him then. Really, I mean, he's a member of the New Orleans Saints. I, uh, you know, I wish him the best. I don't hold any animosity towards him. I think he gave everything he got. Uh, But for, you know, multiple reasons, he's not a Raider anymore, right? Some of it, it's on him. Some of it's on the organization. Some of it's on the coaching staff. Some of it's on the front office. You know, there's multiple reasons why Derek Carr is in New Orleans and not in Vegas anymore. But again, just at this point, it doesn't even matter. You know, the Raiders are moving forward with Jimmy G. They have Brian Hoyer. They have Aiden O'Connell. If that works, if that three-headed monster works, great. If not, they have Chase Garbers as well. Don't want to leave him out. If not, then they'll go back to the drawing board and they'll get another quarterback at some point. But Vader Raiders, like I said, it's great to hear from you, my man. I do appreciate you. I got time for one more, and this is going to be a pretty lengthy text from New York Old School Raiders. Say, yo, Q, New York Old School Raider again. I do appreciate you, Q. You're the hardest working man in radio. Now, I respect Mo Moten, but I have to disagree on, disagree on both Raiders' bold moves that he had in his piece on Bleacher Report. One, why would the Jets give up draft capital to the Raiders for Jacobs when they could sign Dalvin Cook as a free agent? Two, stay away from Patrick Queen. Why would the Ravens, a team that knows defense, pay Roquan big money and let Queen go? Do they think he has already reached his ceiling? Excuse me, I just coughed, and the words Corey Littleton came out of my mouth. So embarrassing. A can't-miss guy that we gave a big contract. No. Instead, go after Isaiah Simmons, a player that has not reached his ceiling on a team that doesn't know defense and is not using them correctly. Excuse me again, I just heard the summer breeze blow by, and it sounded like it said Hassan Reddick. Very refreshing. I'm just saying, be careful what you ask for. Your thoughts, Q, as always, just win, baby. Raiders. That's from New York Old School Raider. And look, I don't think that the Jets are going to make a move for Josh Jacobs either. I really don't. Uh, that was something that Mo put out there on that on that Bleacher Report uh, article that he wrote. And, uh, you know, they have the they do have the, the salary cap space to make something work for Josh. Clearly, they, they're all in on right now trying to win a Super Bowl as they have Aaron Rodgers. They didn't get him just to, you know, change the culture of the team. I mean, he's a guy that he's year to year. They got probably two years of him max. So, yeah, I mean, if they were going to make a move and feel like they were one Josh Jacobs away from a Super Bowl run, maybe they'd make that move. Um, but I, I don't see it either. Dalvin Cook, as you mentioned, he's out there and available. But either way you look at it, I just don't see them making that move for J.J. And as far as, you know, Patrick Queen, I think he's a good linebacker. I don't think he's a great linebacker. I think he's better than what the Raiders have, and he'd add to the Raiders' linebacking room. But, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of, uh, of guys there that can compete and, and try to put their best foot forward and, and make it happen. I think that's the weak link. Isaiah Simmons, he clearly has not been the guy that anybody, including myself, expected uh, when he came out of Clemson. He really never had a, a position. He was one of those guys that said, yeah, he could do a lot. Right? He was a, a, you know, a jack-of-all-trades, a master of none. And you're right, uh, the, the Cardinals really don't do a lot of things well defensively. You saw once Hassan Reddick, you brought him up. Once he got out of the Cardinals system, he really broke out into a really good player that he was expected to be coming out of Temple College. Maybe Isaiah Simmons is a guy, as I believe the Cardinals are rebuilding. Maybe that's a guy that the Raiders could take a look at. But I wouldn't be mad if they found a way to go get either one of those guys uh, you know, by way of trade, as long as they're not giving up a whole lot. And I don't know what kind of contract you'd give Patrick Queen. He does want a contract extension going into the final year of his deal. But if, if, if Dave Ziegler and company feels like he can upgrade the Patrick Graham-led defense, I'd be all for it. If they think it's Isaiah Simmons, that's fine. I just think something needs to be added to that Raiders defense. But thank you so much for that. I definitely appreciate you. That's all I got time for on today's show. Coming up tomorrow, Jordan in Oregon. Got a call from him. Got a text from Raider Rob, plus many more. We'll have more news and notes of the day. We'll continue to be on uh, Josh Jacobs' watch. Is his uh, contract extension, is it going to, uh, you know, is it going to happen sooner rather than later? Is it going to something that happen on possibly Monday the 17th when the deadline comes up, right? Again, I'll talk to Paloma Villacana later on this uh, afternoon, and she'll give us the latest and the greatest that she heard from Josh Jacobs as she sat down with him on her show on Fox 5 Sports. So uh, all that plus a whole lot more will come up on tomorrow's show. And as always, Raider Nation, thanks so much for making the show your first listen of the day. You make sure you can uh, subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. 
as always. So thanks so much. We definitely appreciate you. Appreciate my man Ari. Till tomorrow, Raider Nation, take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Love on your family. Most importantly, as always, just win, baby.